In this video, we're going to describe why we use the Java programming language and specifically why we chose it for this course. The Java programming language has quite a few benefits that work well for us in this course and in programming in general. One thing is it's multi-platform. So you can write a Java program on Windows and run it on a Mac or run it on Linux or vice versa, any combination of those. You can also run a program that has a mixed environment. So you could have one machine that's maybe Linux on the server and then a Windows client and have a Java program that's essentially spread across those two computers. So multi-platform, it's also easy to write a Java program for a variety of devices, even beyond platform. So if you look at Android, Android is based on the Java programming language, but also you can write server-side programs with Java. You can write programs for your PC with Java and uh, quite a few embedded devices as well. So when you think about the Internet of Things, which is a big buzzword these days, you know, Java fits right into this, right into that paradigm. Now, uh, a bit on the history of Java. Uh, Java was released to the public back in to, uh, 1995, uh, which is when I was in college. I got out of college in 97, and so colleges, universities really didn't teach Java programming at that time because it was too new. When I was in college in the 90s, uh, one of the things I heard quite a bit, which I still think is very much true today, is that the half-life of information technology knowledge is about two years. So that means what you've learned now, half of it will be irrelevant in two years, and then two more years from that, another half will be irrelevant, and so on and so forth. Of course, the secret is we don't know which half is going to be irrelevant. And it's interesting, I took up Java programming right when I got out of college, right around 97, 98, uh, thinking that, you know, like everything else, it would have this two-year half-life, when in truth it's been around now for 20 years and is still very strong. So it's kind of nice to have a fundamental base, something like that, that you can grow with. So uh, another interesting thing I'll point out is that there were a lot of Java user groups around the world. One of the first ever Java user group was based here in Cincinnati. Uh, it was founded in 1996, shortly after the release of Java, and it was actually founded as a student group here at UC and has since become a public group. Still meets once a month, uh, usually I think the fourth Thursday of the month. So still a very active group, but now 20 years old uh, and started right here at UC, which is pretty nice. So a lot of things we can do with Java, put it on different devices. Uh, we, it can access a database. It can access a network. Threading, very important. It can do a lot of threading. That means we can have multiple processes running simultaneously. Maybe one listening for user interface events, and then another one that might be synchronizing data in the background. Another one might be doing some housekeeping. Uh, this is all very important stuff. So, neat stuff there. Okay, Java versions. This slide is a bit out of date because it only goes up to uh, 1.5. Since 1.5, 1.6 was released, which is also called Java 6. 1.7. And now Java 1.8 is the newest. So you see, as, as you might expect with a new programming language, there were several versions released pretty frequently, but then as it matures, it slows down a little bit. There are not as many new versions. They're spread further apart. All that being said, there were a lot of uh, new innovations that were added in uh, Java 1.8, so some exciting things that we can take a look at there. So we'll be using Java 1.8 in our class. Okay, uh, a, a few things about Java. It's not JavaScript. If you've done JavaScript before, you'll have a good background to get started, but Java is different uh, from JavaScript. It's also not kind of like a drag and drop environment. It is something where you need to have a text editor. Uh, and it can be complicated, it can be simple as well. So you can write a quick and dirty program, but you can also write a, a huge program that, uh, that has a whole lot of things that are working together. So if someone tells you Java is easy, or someone tells you Java is difficult because it's complex, you know, they, they're, they're both right and they're both wrong. It really depends on what you're doing with it. Um, Java really started its life as a, a way we could write programs that would run in a browser. This is before we had Ajax and Web 2.0 technologies and all the things that we're used to now, the types of things like you see on Facebook, 
where you sit on a page and the page automatically reloads or you have a YouTube video. Uh, 20 years ago, those things just weren't available because the technology wasn't there. So frequently, we would use Java as a little program within a web page that would give the user a dynamic experience. Honestly, now you don't see that much anymore. Now a lot of that's HTML5 or uh, whatever the latest technology is, Ajax and tool sets and things like that. You don't see Java in the browser as much as you used to, just because there are other things that will, uh, other things that, that suit the purpose just as well. Okay, so one of the things that we're going to do in a, in a, in a future video is we're going to write a very simple program using just a text editor and the Java compiler. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how that Java compiler works and how it actually creates programs that can run on completely different operating systems. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But in reality, uh, for this class, you'll be using NetBeans more often than just Notepad because NetBeans is a, an integrated development environment or what we'll call an IDE. Integrated development environment means it can do basically about four things. It has an editor, text editor, where you can write your program. It has a way to compile your program. It can run your program, so you can watch the program run. And also, one of the most important things is it can debug your program. If you don't have a lot of time to commit to this class this semester, or maybe programming's not of interest to you, the most important thing you can do is learn the debugger. That will save you a lot of time, so we're going to learn that early on in this semester. Even if you really like programming, if you don't fit into either of those groups I just mentioned, still, learn the debugger. I'll tell you that uh, debugging, learning debugging is a more important skill than learning programming because honestly, you'll spend a lot of time debugging. Okay, so how does the compiler work? Well, what we're going to have, uh, it kind of has a two-step process. The, the general paradigm in programming is that there are two types of languages, ones that are compiled and ones that are interpreted. Compiled means that we take our program and we convert it from English-like text to a series of zeros and ones that the computer will understand in advance of running it. Okay, Because the computer doesn't know English, but if you saw the previous video, a video from uh, last week where we talked about zeros and ones, that's really what a computer understands. So we have to convert from this English-like language to zeros and ones, and that's essentially what a compiler does. The problem, though, is that the zero and one language is different from one operating system to another. So what would work on an Apple or a Linux device would not work on a Windows device. They speak completely different languages. So not only do we have to con con convert our program to zeros and ones, but we have to do it in a way that the underlying operating system will understand. And here's how Java does that. We start with a text file like I have here, greetings.java. It must have the .java extension. That's the file that we edit. Next, we find the Java compiler, Java C, and that will convert this greetings.java to what we call bytecode. Bytecode is platform independent. It's kind of like uh, not completely native, uh, native zeros and ones, but it takes us close to ze native zeros and ones. Okay. This entire section here, the greetings.java and the greetings.class, is platform independent. You can run a greetings.class on Apple, Linux, Windows, an embedded device, just about anything, uh, possibly even an Android phone, uh, definitely one of the Java SE phones, which would be Blackberry, Nokia, something like that. Uh, so that is platform independent. It's not down to the zero and one level that an operating system will understand. But this thing called the Java Virtual Machine, this is platform dependent. So this is specific to Apple, Windows, or Linux. But the good news is you only have to install it once. It's basically a piece of software that runs on that operating system and knows how to read and run a .class file, uh, kind of like interpreting it. It knows how to change this bytecode in the .class file to the zeros and ones that the operating system will understand. Okay, So JVM needs to be installed on the computer, but only one time. After that, it can read any of these .class files. 
So it's really a two-step compile. Compile to bytecode, then have the JVM interpret the bytecode and run the program. Now you might think that that's an extra step and that that slows down running the Java program, but not necessarily. There are things like a just-in-time compiler that will actually compile it into native zeros and ones right before it runs. There are other optimizations that you can do to, to run a class file natively. So the performance of Java is very close to the performance of other programming languages and sometimes even faster. Uh, in its initial life, there were some inefficiencies, but honestly, being proven out over 20 years, it's now a fairly efficient mechanism and it's suitable for a lot of needs. So that's how we write a Java program. Now, what does a Java program look like? Well, we know what Android apps look like, and we know that those are written in Java syntax. That's not a pure compile like we have here because it runs in a different kind of virtual machine called a Delvic VM, but the syntax is still Java. Another thing that's Java is this tool called Argo UML. You see, this is something that's running right on my computer now with all kinds of widgets, just like any other program that would run right on your PC. So this is written in Java. And then I'll say a little bit about my current employer as well. My employer uh, sells, well, writes and sells point of sale software, so cash register software. Here's a screen capture of that. This is all in Java. And by all Java, I don't mean it's a Java front end with a COBOL back end or a mainframe back end. I don't mean it's a Java back end with maybe a, a, an HTML front end or something like that. I mean literally every piece of code from bringing data in to moving data out to the UI, the events that act within the UI, the housekeeping, everything written in Java. That's really nice because you can learn one skill and you can reapply it many other places. A lot of times I talk about uh, the Southwest Airlines model. You see, I was an accountant by uh, education. My, my first degree was in accounting. And it was all about how to make things more efficient, uh, make processes more efficient and, and less cost. And one of them is what Southwest Airlines does. <laughs> Southwest Airlines only flies 737s, and therefore they only need spare parts for 737s. They only need pilots for 737s and mechanics for 737s. One pilot can only fly one, one type of plane at a time, so you can't have someone fly an MD-88 and then the next day a 737. So the pilots become interchangeable. And a lot of the other discount carriers follow the same approach, like Allegiant is moving to all Airbus A319s and 320s. So a very standard aircraft they use in their entire fleet means fewer replacement parts, fewer pilots, fewer mechanics. Similar thing with Java. Once you've learned Java, you're very versatile. It's a skill that you can use in, in, in many different places. And you can learn some best practices and apply those in, in many places. In 20 years of doing Java myself, or maybe, maybe a shave less than that, but uh, I've definitely written Java programs for mobile phones, server-side, UI, web, all kinds of different things. And it's nice because as you learn better ways of doing things, you can apply that to that entire portfolio, which is why it fits well within our degree program. We start in this class and learn the fundamentals, and you'll continue to build on those fundamentals in computer programming too, and then also in enterprise web development, and then again in Android development. You'll keep building on what you've learned in this class. So this class has a lot of uh, very important lessons that we want to learn, and it's the first chapter in, a, in what's going to be a long book in our uh, programming library. So I hope you've enjoyed this, and I look forward to seeing you in our next video where we're going to connect to the virtual labs, to a Java environment which is already set up for us and ready to use, and then after that we're going to write and run a very simple Java program. I look forward to seeing you then.